<laughs> I'm Mark Akaderberg. <laughs> I'm Stephen Hagen. And we're here to shadow of St. Lotus 7 that occurred at the a end of... A month ago, basically. Yeah, just yeah. about a month. Just about a month ago. So right at the beginning, first week in October. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, we, you know, we had a little cool down time, uh, and, but we are here to chat up some things about 7. And 7 was a bunch of firsts in some way, right? uh, in our ever-growing format. Uh, we had some interesting things happen in seven. So one of the things, of course, is we had had um, a couple uh, rule changes that we had implemented, and we're going to talk a little about those. But let's start off with a shift that we were just talking about, and that is the card on the table. Uh, let's talk about Ancestral Recall. Yeah, this is a big change. So Ancestral, I think, uh, hey, there's Juchems. How are you doing? Oh God! Stop! Stop making noise at me. Thank you. Uh, so, Juchamps, welcome. Uh, yeah, we uh, ancestral recall is a card that, starting off, I think we were inspired by the uh, Avengers history group out of the northwest called Shotgun Lotus, and that has inspired a lot of uh, a lot of things along the way. But one of the big ones is that the first player calls Shotgun on Black Lotus yeah, yeah. Uh, and takes Black Lotus as their first pick. Uh, Black Lotus, obviously, if we consult a ni- our friendly neighborhood bot here, Ninth Seed, and see what he has to say. Uh, pick 1.3 so almost always in first pick but this time was the first time we've seen it in other drafts but Kyle made the bold jump and decided to take Ancestral first yeah so we, we've questioned this before would there be the one where uh, actually in I think it was in the first vaccinated draft in 6 mm-hmm. we were, you know, I had a lot of questions of would that be the one if I had the shotgun seat I was taking Ancestral first in 6 uh-huh. I knew I was uh but yeah, it has happened in others. Uh, it, it's happened in, and just to happen in an online again uh, that's going on right now on Discord. Uh, but this was the first St. Lotus that has happened. And interestingly enough, uh, we were just looking through, it has actually fallen before to, to some weirdness. One, to a complete outlier, someone taking fast bond, trying to make a statement or something, a third pick, where it fell to fourth. Uh, but it's fallen to third a couple times. And so it averages 2.2. Yep. But uh, for St. Lotus, this was the first of this of this real hardcore debate of what is better, Lotus or Recall. Yes. And I, I don't know. I, I think I think we've had a lot of conversations about this in the past, so we're not going to go super deep on it today. But I think that the there's a really good reasons why Recall is better. If you want to be in a blue deck, if you are guaranteed not to jump into one of the like fast Stormish decks, something that wants to... I think Reanimator and Storm are kind of the, the prime seats in, in the first position where mm-hmm. Lotus can be really handy. Or artifact shenanigans of some type. Sure, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it essentially if you know you're going to be in blue and know you don't want to go for one of those crazy aggressive decks, it can be it can be absolutely correct to take a recall. Yeah. So, uh, the... Uh, so, what other what other things are we gonna chat about? Uh, so the next thing is we had some role changes, and one of those was we got on board with a lot of the Discord drafts, and just allowed wastes outright. Um, for you could pick wastes uh, for just as a basic land. Wastes was the sixth basic. Mm-hmm. Uh, it looked like Eric's deck was going to take advantage of that. I, I said on commentary that if anyone was going to, it was going to be Eric. Yep. But Eric ended up deciding he had enough enough colorless lands that he didn't need it. So he, he didn't end up running the wastes. Yep. Uh, but it was there, uh, but didn't really come up. The next one is interesting was we had switched the rule for cards that feed off of each other. Um, yeah, any number of cards. Any number of cards. Uh, so seven dwarves, relentless rats. And Relentless Rats was picked. Yeah. And actually relevant. Um, we saw it on stream. It yeah. actually was, we got to watch it. I think it was match two or three on stream. Yeah. So Kevin brought it in against Brandon, yep. I'm pretty sure. And, you know, switched it out. He switched out his deck. And it's fairly obvious. The part of the problems with this strategy is you can't, like, ninja sideboard them in, right? <laughs> like, it's a problem, really. But, yeah, well, I it mean, is true. It, 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 I think there is something to do for a ninja sideboard, you know. But, like, you can't... You, they know what's coming. Sure. But it seemed rather... I mean, Brandon beat it, but it was a... You know, it involved a settle the wreckage and... Yes. Um, some a lucky very, settle the wreckage. A lucky settle and some very sharp play from Brandon. It was just a yes. very constant threat of big rats. Uh, actually, no, what ended up winning that one was... Uh, I think of Lucky Settle, but what ended up getting there was Invincible, um, a complete uh, ultimate from Nyssa. Sure, that's because right. Because yeah, all the lands. His forests, be, all of his creatures became indestructible, and he could block the rats forever, basically. Exactly. But he would never have had that chance if he hadn't been able to get the settle in play. Right. 
It was pretty. It was a. It was a really fun watch, fun match to watch. So rats was relevant. Uh, we still think discussing um, that the other one that could possibly be relevant would be then uh, partitioners. Yeah, persistent partitioners is, is, I think, a better card. Uh, I think that there's an argument for it. Um, I think rats is safer, uh, but I, I think that partitioners is one that you could even run main deck and like be able to defend it. I don't know how to spell this card. Uh, you just. Uh, um, but yeah. I, I think it's a it's a card that you could. Just play 15 of in your deck, or play like 18, 10, somewhere in that, yeah, some, somewhere in like the 10 to 20 range in your deck of good blue cards, and all of a sudden you're a control deck that just like, yeah, if you if you can last till turn 6 or 7, nobody's playing uh, sweepers in this format, so right. like, they're not going to be able to shut down your deck. If you can kind of control the fast decks and then just use this as your win con, you're spending a single card, a single pick, to get your uh, to get to get half your deck filled up, and all of a sudden your control deck has a has a whole crew sitting with them. It seems incredibly strong to me. Yeah, because then the rest of the cards can all be sideboard cards. Super inevitability. Yeah. Yes, because um, yeah, you would probably need two activations before you win the game. Milling twenty four cards seems like good enough in most of these games to win. Absolutely right. I mean, because you got to count because you're going from forty, you're drawing your seven, you're at thirty three, yep. and then you know you're going to draw some natural by that point. Yeah, you know, twenty four is yeah. going to get there. Yeah. Uh, so the next one was something that we found interesting. So this had come up in VRD6 in discussion. Um, Mason and some of the Chicago crew had mentioned that Eldrazi and Reality Smasher decks had mm -hmm. been uh, a big threat up in their Chicago. And, and we don't have all the win-loss records for Chicago. We They've dumped a lot of their data on us but from the drafts, but we don't have all the full records. But it had definitely come up there. And it's something we hadn't seen here. Right. Uh, Eric jumped into it with Eldrazi and Taxus. And ties for first place and loses in the finals, right? Goes five and two. And that, that last match, man. We'll get to it, but that yeah. was an incredible one to watch. Uh, so that was another kind of big step here in an, an ongoing discussion in the community on Discord about, you know, the role of mid-range in this format and uh, combo versus mid-range mm -hmm. and, you know, where we're at with that. So I think this is a, a continuing evolution of a discussion about what actually is this format. And I don't, my take is I don't think it's what a lot of people think it is in a lot of ways. I, I think it's, well, one, I think it's always shifting and, you know, always a little more open uh, than people think. This is, a, yeah, we've talked about this a lot, but the reason I love this format is because it's not solved, right? Like a lot of formats, it's, yeah, you have LSV and Raptor and all these people come in and just kind of, they'll they'll pound it and they're smarter than the rest of us and they will figure it out. And then, then we can play that format and that's a lot of fun. I still love Legacy, still love playing all those formats. Uh, but this format, nobody's trying to solve, right? People yeah. are playing it once every month to every three months uh, and you get to see wild things tried. And you don't know if they're worked because they got lucky that one time or if they saw a thing that's now reshaping the format. So right. we'll see what happens with Eldrazi over the next few drafts, but I think it's here to stay. It, it, I don't think it's going to be a every draft, but I think that it's there if somebody wants it. Yeah, and we'll talk more about that when we do a full breakdown over the, the, the drafts, for sure. Yep. Uh, then the last big story is Brandon Curry. Yeah, seeing him win that tournament was incredible. <laughs> the culmination of three years of him be participating. Yeah, so Dr. Pee Pee Poopy Pants himself, our uh, in-house token uh, has has been coming to these things for a very long time, and he he's always you know he plays well, but he always plays with his Brandon Flair, and and has some some crazy stuff, and you know he this time he says he's coming in and he's going to uh, he does not have a plan at all. He's just going to see what other people do and kind of react. That was obviously a lie. He told me his plan ahead of time. We, okay. just, we, we brainstormed the balance deck <laughs> for like three hours the night before. <laughs> what uh, a liar. Yeah, but, but I mean, I, I, like, he's not wrong, though. He didn't right. He didn't have a list that he was going right, to pick right, from. Right, right. But he knew he wanted to do a balance deck. He wanted to leverage to fairy. He okay. wanted to take Oko. Uh, <laughs> I'll never forgive him. Yeah. Uh, but, but no, this is the first draft that we've seen him in out of, what, five that he didn't take Altar of the Brood. Right, right, right. So, so he doesn't take some of his regular cuteness here. Yep. Uh, and he really leveraged leverages this kind of, again, another continued discussion, uh, the power of Planeswalkers, right? Yes. And so there's an article forthcoming that discusses this uh, that will be on our St. Lotus page. Uh, but, you know, like Walkers had had a small role uh, mm -hmm. prior and then VRD2, St. Lotus 2, um, really starts to see the big shift of Walkers. That's when Elaine came in, right? Uh, the me and Elaine both That's in right. that one. Yeah. So, um, and I have the numbers in my forthcoming article where I talk about it. But 
uh, St. Lotus 2, like, it, it's just a massive spike, like an over-tripling of walkers in the main deck. Yes. Um, Th- that's and, also right around War of the Spark coming out. Yeah, right? it's right after, it's the first one after War of the Spark, right? I pick, yes. uh, so I pick Lotus with my first pick, and then I pick Narset and Karn on the wheel. Yes. Uh, and then, you know, and uh, so, but it blows it open in a lot of ways, and since then we've seen this continued massive growth of walkers, except for a dip in six. There's a, a big dip in BRD six. Oh, interesting, yeah. Uh, a, a, a massive dip down. But so Brandon is convinced that walkers are BRD Jesus, <laughs> and he he jumps in, the, jumps all board here with a super friends list. Yes. I mean, starts O2. So the story, of course, the real interesting story is he starts O2. Oh, and he was pissed. Yeah. He loses to Mason, uh, who ends up eventually 4-3. and three. He loses to Cody, who ends up 4-3. and three. Uh, And then he rips off a whole bunch of matches in a row. Let's and, cut over and actually take a look at his deck. This might be a good time to, to dig into that one a little bit. Yeah. Um, we, we can save some of the other conversation, but mm-hmm. I definitely want to see like how many walkers he had in his list. Right, Teferi, Oko... Double Karn, yeah. Jace. Jace ended up going 13th pick this time, which, I mean, we talked about this. I don't, Jace is not the card he was at the, in 2010 when this format no. was created, right? When the first one going back to the Watsi days was drafted. Jace is probably one of the top two picks of the of first two round picks. So we got five, All we got down to... six at Nyssa, seven at Karn Liberated, mm-hmm. and eight at Dovin Hand of Control. So he's got eight main deck walkers, and he does bring in Elspeth uh, in matches wow. as well. So I don't know if he sides out a walker for it, but I, I definitely saw him bring in Elspeth. So. Yeah, I mean, Elspeth, like... Against the red deck, obviously, is a great way to shut it down. Yeah. But it's also just a finisher. Not right. that he has really need for a finisher with the culmination. Um, but, I mean, to go along with that, there's also a really nice kind of set of answers, right? He has cheap answers mm-hmm. and counters. And, and cheap answers via counter spells and then walkers to finish it off. And he has balance to act as a, to, as a cleanup if he needs it to. You know what my favorite card in his deck was? I assume it's Karn the Great Creator? No. Oh. Yeah, it's, you know, it's one of my favorites, but no. The best card in his deck in a lot of ways, Oath of Nyssa. Interesting. I watched that card do so much work, right? So Oath of Nyssa was a uh, it's kind of a pioneer special. It did really well in Pioneer Absolutely. when it first hits, uh, enough to, well enough to get banned. So Oath does a couple things here, right? It digs for an extra land uh, or a creature or a walker, right? So it digs that little bit. It acts as a mini brainstorm in some way. And then it also allows him to just not worry about his lands when it comes to playing his walkers. Yes. And this card did work all day long. And he has so many planeswalkers in his deck too. Like it's just ha- having eight planeswalkers plus uh, plus seventeen lands plus right. probably five creatures. Like he's he's going to hit every single time. Also, and su- then not have to worry about mana fixing. As super much. super smart grabs the Caracas. Yep. Um, you know, but yeah, so he can get uh, spell queller off of that. He can get birds off of that. Those are only two creatures in his deck, mind you. Or three. Spell Quiller, Birds, and Noble Hierarch. Oh, Monastery Mentor. So we had four creatures in his deck. Mm-hmm. And Mentor did work. Uh, I saw Mentor did a lot of work. Um, and then, of course, Balance, right? Like, I didn't see him pull it off on camera. Um, but Balance is this uh, very powerful, powerful card in the Walker strategy that we had not seen really utilized. And I think Balance is underdrafted and underutilized anyway, True. right? Yeah. Like, Balance is a scary card. Uh, but it doesn't affect his walkers, right? So if he can just drop a couple, one or one or two walkers, and then balance the board out, you know, you drop drop a car and Scion of Urza, yes. where you can now just make guys. <laughs> well, and then the real the real magic is when you have uh, Teferi sitting there uh, alongside it. You can then balance at instant speed. Right. It's just completely wild. Um. But so, so yeah, after that draft happened, after Brandon pulled off his miracle of, of running it back uh, for his 5-2 victory into a win in finals on camera. And also, yeah, just like you mentioned earlier, I want to clear the Like, if you have not watched that, folks, like, pop in and watch that. Like, watch yeah. the final and then watch the interview. Like, his high. It was amazing. Was amazing. And then Eric's interview afterward. Like, Eric felt really, you know, it was just, like... It was a reason we do this. It was a community driver. It immediately made me go start an article. It immediately <laughs> made me want to just, you know, to talk more about this format. Brandon and I talk are now talking on Discord all the time about this format, yep. like pitching our crazy ideas off each other. And it was it was something it was just special. Right? It was what makes this community kind of really cool. And you should go watch it. it it's a feel good interview. Yeah. And just the last match was also like really well played. Oh, it was, it was, so it was good. a really tight match all around. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. 
But yeah, so, so after that match happened, you mentioned it, right? Like, it's, I felt like it dragged everybody back in. Uh, like, I, no, matter, no matter how much you love something, it always kind of, it can become a drag. You're running a thing, but that one, I think, re-energized me in a lot of ways. Right. And you could see it did for lots of other people, too, right? The Discord was just exploding uh, for the next, like, for the next two weeks straight. People yeah. were just on there every night chatting about it. Uh, there was uh, there were two drafts that fired off <laughs> within, yeah. like, a week of each other. Yeah, Eric's in one of them. I'm in one of them. Yep. Brandon's, Brandon's, Brandon's in one. one. Yeah. Sam, his girlfriend's in one. Yeah, um, it's just a, it's it's wild how much it's happening. Uh, and the other thing that kicked off from that is it inspired a group here in St. Louis to actually run their own VRD, which we're going to be announcing the date of soon, but that we're going to be covering. We're going to do a St. Louis yeah. presents. Uh, St. Louis Lotus presents. presents. Exactly. There's going to be a. Ooh. We're going to have Eric Levine on there for commentary, along with a couple commentators from their side. Yeah. Uh, and it will be kind of. The same, the same energy, the same St. Lotus. Uh, we're only going to stream the draft portion of it, but we are going to we're going to have another streamed Vintage of History draft coming up in yeah. this month. So that'll, that'll be very exciting. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really great to see kind of the energy draw back in and, and really like create a lot of good feelings around this format. Yeah, and and people just talking in general, right? Like the growth of the community. Uh, you know, yes. we were approached by somebody that had heard about it through their F and M in Wisconsin, in Milwaukee. Oh, Milwaukee that's and right. you know, they had heard about us, and they approached us, and and they're doing one right online right now as well. And and she's gonna be coming down. Uh, so for the next next St. Lotus yeah. uh, on the eighth, St. Lotus official in the in uh, January. Yes. So. St. Lotus 8. Yep. We're finally actually finishing the full pod of, of drafts. <laughs> <laughs> it took three years. Our, our three-year anniversary is coming up, too. That's, yeah. on, that's in February. We're going to have a 30-year anniversary of St. Lotus. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it'll be great to have it'll be great to have somebody else come down. Um, but let's, let's dig into the draft. Okay. So uh, we, can, we can go seat by seat. Maybe we should – we talked about Brandon, I think, enough. He's got right. enough coverage and enough goodwill. Um, Eric, though, in finals, Eric made the jump into Reality Smasher. Uh, coming off of kind of an interesting start, right? Mox Jet as the first pick. I guess it's just the best available Mox. Yeah. He didn't want to be messing around with Sapphire. Right. Uh, and then we jumped into Mana Vault and then went immediately for Land Denial. Right. Yeah, I, I loved this draft in the beginning. I I wasn't 100% sure where he was going with it early on. Uh, I But, I, you know, there was you could tell he was going to taxi with the Thalia, right? Oh, yes. Um, I, the Mystic Forge threw me for a loop. Right, like on camera, I was just like, "What? I don't get this. I don't. I don't. I don't get this pick. I don't think that's where he's going." It felt weird. I still like after watching his matches. I don't know if the forge ever did great for him. I don't, I, I don't think it should have been in the deck. Um, it could have been something else. But like then when he hits, then you know metamorph. So finally hits at fourteen with thought not seer. I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, full on. This is where we're going. Um, and it, it makes sense. I think Ugin the Ineffable is really good in here. Mm -hmm. Um, with lowering the cost of all of his Eldrazi and any of his artifacts, and then also just acting as either bodies and or a Vindicate. Yes. Um, minus the lands. He's got a very, very solid Eldrazi and Taxis list here. Um, and, and I think it showed off a deck that, I mean, we always talked about how DNT was such a cool idea and maybe it could actually come together. This feels like the way that it comes together. Because I think DNT by itself is just a little weak, right? Like, unless you're really leaning on the white sideboard hate and that's kind of, you're primarily a sideboard deck that has some creature beat down that might catch incidental things in game one, but you're just leaning on games two and three. This feels like a game that can win all three matches, all three games. Here's the difference, I think. I think you're 100% right. And I think I'm seeing the difference play out in my current draft uh, online a lot. Where I I went for a black red kind of discard aggro sure. uh, format. I'm amazing. Some of my matches that I've lost, I've had amazing starts, blowing out their hand. Mm -hmm. My own version of taxes, right? And then I can't close the game quick enough with a bunch of little guys. Sure. I think that's the difference. This the difference in the traditional death and taxes in this format. It's the same thing. You can tax them, you can shut them out, but you can't close the game out quick enough. Yeah. For it to matter. And then someone else's, their combos will catch up, their bigger things will catch up, et cetera, et cetera. This, with the big Eldrazi, allow you to slow them down and then close out the game. Yeah, no, it's it's because you always just have the chance that I'm gonna drop a I'm gonna drop a five mana five five haste at any point in the game, mm -hmm. and you better try to stay above five life. It's almost you you effectively only have 15 life total at the start because you just never know when it's gonna drop on you. Um, it's a pretty cool thing. The the only the only like 
question I'd have is, is one the Mystic Forge, I think, but that's like a relatively minor thing. He took mm-hmm. it pretty early, but it's he was up against two other artifact decks with Kevin and Kyle both sitting there. Right. Uh, so I, I see why he wanted to grab it if he wanted it for his list. Um, I don't think he necessarily needed it. The other piece is I think that with wastes being available and being free, I don't think he needed to take as many lands as he did. Right. right? It's great to be able to have both of his colors of colorless and white, um, but he took a lot of land picks that I think could have been sideboard cards. Right. But that's the only, like... Those are pretty minor complaints. But he's still got pretty good sideboard. I well, mean, he's still got yes. Abolish, which blows out game. He's still got this member, Kataki, who's doing work. Abolish uh, was his all-star, though. Yeah. Abolish was the one he was most proud I, of. I didn't there. even know about this card, to be honest. Like, yeah, I, it, I, I, I've missed this one, and it's pretty rare that I miss one. And uh, like, even including Commander missed this one. Like, I'll play this in Commander. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, yeah, that card was amazing. Like, so many blowouts with it. Uh, I didn't necessarily like the Inbringer. I get it. But, I mean, that one's fine. Yeah. Um, uh, timely was great, except it probably I would have picked the upgraded, the new timely, mm-hmm. uh, whatever it's called that that you draw a card. Um, sure. But that's a brand new card, so it's easy to overlook. That one also doesn't make as many creatures, does it? It makes as many creatures. It doesn't gain as much life. I, got I think it. it only gains four life. Okay, so with a mono red player, I could see the argument for timely then. Right, but it makes as many creatures. It's four life, two creatures, and a card. I think on the new timely three creatures. Is it three? Yeah. Okay. So timely is bonkers. Okay, I thought uh, it was still two. I played a lot of timely reinforcements in standard. Yeah, I, I did too. It's just been a while. <laughs> yeah, no, it has been a minute. Um, oh, it is three. Okay. Yeah. yeah, getting the trials is the card that I was super impressed with, and it's a great forty-six pick. But yeah, I loved it. Uh, at one point, he uh, he gets up after game one and just shows me his sideboard plan, and I'm like, oh, you're getting the trials. He's like, yeah, if if I resolve this card against uh, if I if I resolve it against uh, Cody's deck. He can't win. He has literally no card in his deck that can win. Right. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that's that's accurate. <laughs> and it turned out there was actually one that could, but it didn't. He didn't draw it. Right. Um, but yeah, there's just he, if he resolves to get in the trials, uh, Cody had essentially no way to win. Even if you brain freeze him out, it's like attacking with a Thassa's Oracle over and over. Maybe <laughs> uh, it just doesn't really work. So yeah. it, it was a really cool pickup for him. Uh, GT did a was was amazing for him. Right. It did a ton of work. Yes. And and I think this is a card that. I, mean, I guess it, it. I guess it depends. The more creatures, the higher it should be drafted. Uh, I would say this is a card that's been underdrafted. I, I know it has been drafted. Um, I think it's fine. Yeah, let, let's pull up the list. But I, I don't. I don't. This is a card that, in a field full of combo decks, is very bad. Right. And in a field full of creature decks, is obviously very good. Right. And I, I don't think. I don't think in general. It's okay, been so it's been drafted more than I thought. Forty-three, fifty-six. That's a lot. Yeah. It hasn't been drafted in St. Lotus as much. I don't think. True. That's true. Um, but no, his deck is great. Yeah. I, obviously, he made it in finals. That's right. fantastic. Um, so working down from there, then we have Cody and Mason. And the tie uh, for third. Also, oh, Cody, Mason, and Kyle. Right. Sorry, all, we had a three-way tie for uh, fourth, fifth. And we did third. not. Uh, we did not break it this time. We no. we just decided uh, first place gave a concession of the give up one of their bottles of booze and give everybody a bottle. Right? Yeah, uh, and, and we'll talk about some of the rule changes, but that's one that's going to be sticking around. It's yeah. just a, it's a great solution to not having to be going until 10 p.m. at night every time. Right. Um, well, let's start with uh, one then. I start with Kyle. Um, so Kyle has a starts with recall and mm-hmm. then grabs the Tinker and Blightsteel. Um, you know, boom, boom. Uh, you know, probably can vo- float the Blightsteel for a little bit, but just gets it out of the way. Yeah. Um, you know, there are a handful of cards that I think are legitimately hate pickable, and Blightsteel is probably one of them. Um, I, there's see, only one that I would actually do, but I think Blightsteel, I, I could see an argument for Blightsteel. I don't see it. I think Blightsteel is fine. Um, I don't think it's. Uh... I think with Tinker, there's lots of other cards you can get right. that are equally terrifying. I think the issue with Blightsteel is that like you want to grab it because if there is a sneak and show deck, they also want Blightsteel. That's right? fair. Yeah, yeah. If you see somebody else kind of angling in that direction, I can right. see going there. But I, I do think this is too early, right? I don't yeah. think he needs it here. I think you could do a 20th pick. Right. I agree with Hyphen and Chat. Um, the, I mean, but, Cody yeah. would have grabbed it. Sure. No, that's different. Maybe? No, that's yeah, online. Never mind. That's yeah, online. I I, I'm confusing my drafts at this point. There have been, been a lot of yeah. them firing at the same time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So definitely this one, I think he can float that. Yeah. Um, uh, time walk it keeps going down and down the list. Uh, I looked back at my like shameful three hour sleep draft that I keep calling it. Yeah. Uh, and I took time walk second pick, which is obviously just wrong. But I think even sixth pick might be. That's like right about where it should be. I, I tell you what. Um, I think Urza's better. Uh, Urza's definitely better. I think. In the with a rise, if there is a rise of walkers, time walk gets better because time true. walk becomes infinitely better in the walkers deck. That's true, right? <laughs> so, uh, in fact, time walk becomes very, very scary in the walkers deck. 
Uh, so I think that's an interesting take because I've been one that's called Time Walk often just, a, you know, a, an explorer. Yeah. Uh, but I think with the Walker's deck, it is powerful. That's a that's a really good call. Uh, Academy was really good for him all day. I mean, obviously Academy is, uh, you know, a very good card. But, I you know, I saw him just doing a lot of work. Urza was phenomenal. Painter Grindstone, again, a pick that you probably could have broken up, but it's fine. He doesn't want to get sniped, especially with, I don't know... He's seen some of the other players around here. He knows mm-hmm. they can get a little wild. He doesn't yeah. necessarily want to be floating things. Um, so he just, I think Kyle did a really good job of playing tight. He didn't necessarily uh, go for high risk plays that look flashy, but he just like, he came in there and got business done. Uh, right around uh, pick 21, we took Ristic Study. I was like, oh, that's a little odd. And then uh, when he fell into Welding Jar, pick 28, I'm like, something's up. That's, that's when I'm just, okay, now what yeah. is happening? So the real story here, of course, was that Kyle had a plan the whole time to backdoor lantern control. <laughs> it worked. I can bl- I'm i blown away that that deck came together and did yeah. anything at all. I'm surprised by the main deck, Bottled Cloister. I think you, you may bring that in in some matches. Um, but, you know, the it... It did work. It was, you know, uh, I mean, it's it wasn't as slow as I thought it was going to be. And There's only like three or four creature decks out of the table. Yeah. yeah. So Slaver did a lot of work for him as well. So yeah, overall, I think this was a really solid list. Um, I, I think he, you know, he had a plan. Uh, he stuck with it. I think he reached on a couple cards. Dressed down probably way too high. I think he could have floated the defense grid, though. I mean, with a Karn deck, you never know. Probably didn't need the trading post at all. Right. <laughs> I mean, trade and post, life, it's life gain against my, against the red deck. Okay, that's right. right. I mean, you, you pitch a card and gain four life. Did he get the bridge? Is that is that in this list? Yeah, I'm pretty sure bridge is in his list. You just, oh, yeah, there it is. Pick 14. Yeah. It's an area yeah. bridge. Um, so that, that should have actually been a good signal for me, too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with with bridge, obviously, a trading post goes way up the ring. Instead. Yeah. Yeah, trading post is pretty flexible. I mean, and it, it can sac- it can also bring uh, artifacts back from his yard and everything, sure. too. Yep. It gets artifacts. You, know, um, you know me in trading posts, so I, I sure do. <laughs> Actually, like Dream Render again, one of those uh, War of the Spark Walkers that just the static ability isn't good enough by itself, but it's yeah. also it's graveyard hate against Nemo as all sorts of good stuff going on. Yeah, I and mean, just get rid of four. I mean, just starts with good answers there. So Cody's deck initially, I thought it was a train wreck. Then I thought it was oh he split the difference on two different decks. It fell kind of apart, and then by the end of the tournament, I think it's the best storm deck I've ever seen. Yeah, this deck I was really low on, I will fully admit. I So again, we've seen a lot in the past of this split deck, like you mentioned, right? Where, especially with the Storm decks, where uh, people start with a something and then they kind of audible into Storm. Right, in this case, um, start Time Vault, that's a deck on its own, and all of a sudden right. you start splitting over into taking, uh, taking uh, Mystical Tutor and Imperial Seals. It's just like, what's going on? Right, so he gets this early on, right? Like, this is the only time... That, this is a lack of blue drafters. And we've never seen, that, to my knowledge, at least not in St. Lotus, somebody get, like, all of the free counter spells. Right. Right, he's got both forces, uh, including negation and five. He's got mana drain, right? He's, so he's got this time vault, demonic tutor, starts off with down to Narset, volcanic. And he has this amazing control shell. And I'm just like, you're going... He's going this sweet control deck. Absolutely. This is going to be amazing, right? Control with time vault win. And then we he goes into the breach and LED and like my world just gets thrown right. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, like he missed out on Tezzeret the Seeker and picked twenty three. Like you you think that a time vault deck would want Tezzeret in like the first ten? Right. Uh, but yeah, he just didn't want it apparently. Uh, but no, his, his deck ended up doing some really incredible things. There's some picks. That, there's some picks that I think you can like question a little bit like i don't really know if you need to go for the the combo deck off of the dual caster mage yeah that one i the didn't like or witch well the problem the, the sedge is good the problem with the dual caster one combo is that you have to have another target and that's actually bit him in one game i saw oh i see was that he went for he went for it and then realized he needed uh it it, it you can't stop it if you don't have another target to target other than the dual caster, it so, will keep so going. So how does this combo actually work? I've never actually seen it happen. I okay, just, so I, I, ca- I cast dual caster mage. Yes. And Or I had dual caster mage, so get the twin flame is the other one. Sure. Um, so he ran dual caster, but not twin flame main deck. Interesting. Right. And dual, it makes sense when right? You sideboard into it if you need it. Dual caster has a lot of flexibility. It's okay. good at copying their spells. It's like a bad right? tree. Yeah. yeah. It's a counter spell, though. You can mm-hmm. counter their counter spell when in, in a counter war. Uh, sure. I think it's better than Lutri because it can counter their do their spells too. That tracks. Okay. Um, so what the twin flame does is you copy. You go to copy right and um, the the creature. And then you put the token. I think you have to have strive. Uh, someone explain this to me. I, uh, 
for each target so you, beyond the first. Choose any number of target creatures you control. For each of them, put a token that's a copy of that creature onto the battlefield. Those tokens have haste to exile them at the beginning of the next instep. So basically, the dual caster copy, you work it out to where you copy the dual caster. I think you have to copy the twin flame targeting something. It's complex. I don't know. Yeah. Basically, you keep copying the, the, the twin flame. Got it. And then that keeps targeting the dual caster. Sure. And then you end up with an army of hasty dual casters. Got it. But you have to have another target to end it with. Got it. And I I saw him try to do it once and it didn't work because he didn't have another target. Gotcha. Even with any number, you can't change the number at the point that you are copying it. Right. You can just change the targets. Right. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, the the deck obviously performed very well. Uh, Went four and three, ended up taking third. This is one of those drafts where. a lot of times we see kind of a bifurcated draft where we end up with an 07 or something or somebody goes uh, goes 6 and 1 it throws everything way off. Right. In this case we had basically everyone clustered around the 5 2 4 3 seed. Um, so it was a really like middle kind of a, a nice probability distribution that was a normal curve. Um, which means that we had three uh, three people stuck in the in the sorry yeah three people stuck in the 4 3 slot. Yeah. So one thing I like about this list, and this is not a comment I was going to have for later, but I think this is a good spot to put it in, is so I've drafted Opposition Agent twice now in two yep. different drafts. And it, I, I've i come to the side, though, I was really high on this card, that this card is really good, but it's really good in one type of deck. Mm-hmm. And that is a deck that's not trying to tap out every turn. So currently I have it in my red-black discard list. And a lot of the times it, it's bad for me early because I'm wanting to cast like a him and something else on turn three. I don't want to hold up mana, right? Um... Oh, so, so there's a rules question about the... the um, I don't know. I'm not 100% sure on that combo. I, I, it was explained to me. And <laughs> uh, so let's. I'm going to pull up Dual Caster Mage one last time. We'll jump back to it. My understanding is that Dual Caster allows you to change, pick new targets for the copy, but you can't change the number. The number right. is locked in, but you can change the target of that number. So it's locked in at one target. Right. Since it was already decided to be one target, every copy will be one target. You don't yes. get a change... The number of targets right it doesn't say you may make new choices for the spell or whatever right. the, whatever the wording would be for that one so essentially the the choice is locked in uh and you have chosen one but you can choose a different one if you want to so right that's that's my understanding of it at least but um but yeah opposition agent you said it, it's good basically if you want to be holding up mana at the end of the right turn. so like the two decks i've run it in were green black uh discard combo mm-hmm. uh, money and then red black uh discard aggro sure right and it's fine when I get it late game in those, when I have the extra mana. Mm-hmm. Uh, but early when I want it, when I want to blow out a fetch, when I want to blow out an early tutor, um, I'm not holding up the mana, right? And then, uh, but in this deck, Opposition Agent is amazing, right? Because right. he is holding up mana very often. He's not doing those early things, right? So this is the type of deck that really wants Opposition Agent. Sure. And I think it will really, really shine in. Uh, but yeah, if he's not holding up mana, it means he's probably going to win off of uh, right. Castino Thaza's Oracle that turn after yeah, exactly. Brand Freezing. I, I, I was very impressed with this deck, and it really makes me think that this Underworld Breach, Lion's Eye Diamond, Brain Freeze combo, like those three cards, you can just drop them into a bunch of decks, and you don't necessarily need to build around them the way Storm decks often try to. Mm-hmm. I think they can just be a good deck on their own, and you can just like throw it in there, win the game off of those three cards, and have a Thaza's Oracle to pay you off at the end. But mm-hmm. it's... They're, none of them are bad on their own, and you get free wins off of them sometimes. Yeah, he he, he tried to force... There was a couple games where he tried to force the combo a yep. little bit early, and he, he ended up being short. Um, so you got to watch it, uh, because, you know, he ran out of cards. To, sometimes you got to brain freeze yourself, for example, yeah. to, to fuel your... Game one of match one. That was a rough way to start the tournament, and that happened to him. Yeah. So. But, I mean, it's definitely... It, it's a it's a, it's a a tough line of play to play, because you got to do it right. Because you got to know when to target the brain freeze yourself totally. to fuel your stuff. And when to target others, and but uh, if you're if you're a good player and you can pull it off, I don't know if that's a deck for me. I, I'll, I'll fizzle it every <laughs> time. Uh, but uh, you know, I just want to wreck your hand or your land base and make you bad at magic like me. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I think that they're really strong. And and I had not Underworld Breach had not succeeded anywhere in the St. Lotus since it had been drafted. Correct. This was the best of the Underworld Breaches we had seen as well. Yeah, I think it was a really good deck all around. Yeah. Let's jump over to Mason though. Mason obviously won the last one with mm-hmm. Elves. Uh, this had a lot time, of pressure. Ha, yeah, had, did, did incredibly well. Uh, this time went into a Hull Breacher wheel deck. Um, so kind of did the wheel thing. And again, wheels uh, didn't do as well as you hoped. Like he, he obviously <laughs> did fine, right? He ended up tied for third. Um, but you could kind of see that he was hoping his deck would do better. Yeah. Um, and it's it's just uh, even with uh, Hull Breacher and all the wheels, uh, he also went for the Leovold. So he had two kind of wheel payoffs. Uh, but it just didn't, it didn't really... 
come together for the like crushing victory. He had to be scrapping for a lot of the victories he got, and because he's a good player, I think he brought it to a four and three. Right. I think if this were in the hands of a weaker player, it would have gone for a two five type of deck. It, yeah. didn't, it didn't seem like it well, played it, as well as it looked on paper. I mean, the Wheels plan I, I saw work a few times. I think a lot of his wins came from the Valakut plan, right? Sure. I mean, that's really, I think, the real story here is that he ends up playing, he plays Valakut. He, you know, um, he plays Prime Time in Valakut. And he had some sick, 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 like, just multiple land Valakut dry, uh, dry, dry, dryad of the Elysian Grove place. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I, there was one off camera. It was like a turn five win off Valakut. Wild, you know. I mean, it was just like a fast bond, uh, coarser, all sorts of you know shenanigans, and uh, so I think Valakut would for me was the more interesting thing here. But yeah, I, I think Wheels will always continue to be a deck as long as we have Holbridge in these things. But I, I, it definitely doesn't seem to perform. It looks sexy. I yep. think a lot of people really you know are attracted to it. It looks cool, but it does not seem to perform as well as people think it's going to. And this is the time where we saw fast bond go seventh round mm-hmm. we've also seen fast bond we just look back at that one wild draft where it got picked third which is just obviously ridiculous but yeah fast bond got floated a lot later here than usual um mason kind of tried to push this the fetch lands very early taking uh two fetch lands in fourth and fifth position three uh, yeah three fourth, March, fifth, March sixth. yeah and then again in uh and then went for duels in ninth and again this is two drafts in a row he takes the thought season inquisition of the two three yep and doesn't play the main deck that's wild. And I, I still don't... I understand what he what he's doing, and maybe he just decided... That, and there wasn't even that much competition for the black here, so I don't know... I, I don't like that play. I don't... You know, I mean, I think Mason's a better player than I am, and I, I could just be wrong. It does give him a powerful sideboard plan, but um, I am just not a big fan of that. It seems like those Earl... That's two things that you can be doing powerful, powerful things with. Well, and this gets into the, the like, beauty of a VRD, right? Is like... You can either try to stay open for as long as possible, right? Or you can dive into a lane. And in his case, he's he's like a smart enough player to say this lane isn't good enough for me. I need to jump back out of it, go somewhere else instead. Um, and I think either of those strategies are fine. One of them basically is a higher risk maneuver, right? Like if he happened to be in a mono black deck, or like ended up in something where those cards are great, all of a sudden he has two of the best deck cards in the format sitting there in his hand. Well, um, I think there's another. I think there's a middle ground between that though. Sure. And that's a you have four lanes. You have five lanes, right? And you, um, they have some overlap, right? So you know, like, okay, well, if I end up, the three of these are going to be Thoughtseize and Inquisition decks. And yeah, I may not end up in the, the one that I wanted first, but I can end up in one of these other two Thoughtseize Inquisition decks. Yeah. Right? And that you, you have a series of lanes. And I think that that's, because I mean, it's not like Thoughtseize and Inquisition are overly difficult to um, squeeze into a deck. Right, particularly when you're valuing lands as high as highly as Mason does. Yeah, I think the lands, the lands is the part where I, I, I'm, a, I think I am lower on the multicolor decks in this format than most people are. Mm-hmm. I think that basically sideboard cards are far better than trying to splash into your third and fourth color, uh, and definitely your fourth this, color. I agree. Third sure. color, on yeah. yeah, I think there's yeah. lots of reasons to go to three colors. I just think that more people do it than should. I think there's right. a lot of times where a solid two-color deck where you didn't have to spend five picks on something is going to be better off than a deck where you spend the cards for the mana and get to play two additional cards. Right. Which I think is actually a nice segue into let's talk about Jago's deck a little bit. Oh, well, one quick one more thing. I sure. will say beautifully, I, I saw a lot of beautiful use of Summer's Pack and Teleria West in, in, his, in his play. Um, they, you know, they really showed off his ability as a player to, you know, mm-hmm. think through some pretty complex lines, and he used those very effectively. Yes. Yeah. No, that does not shock me at all. Um, yeah. I'm sure Tabernacle is also like an all star. Um, yeah, just a lot of really cool to see an actual lands deck show up here. Yeah. Uh, so Jago comes down from Chicago uh, with uh, from from Chicago Jago, right? Yes. Uh, comes down with Mason, and goes where. You know, we've kind of talked about for a while. Uh, is, is the red deck a thing? What, what does the red deck look like? Starts off game one on camera with a win against Cody. Mm-hmm. And it looks pretty... I think it was Cody. That there. Is it Cody or Kyle? Um, but it looks pretty strong, right? Um, Dragon's Rage Channeler ended up doing a ton of work. Yeah, just a really impressive kind of fast, got the job done, walked out. Yeah, I think... <sighs> He filled up, I I did not think he was going to be able to fill up his yard well enough for Chandler to be super effective. Um, it from what I saw, it worked better than I thought, right? But I thought that 
I, th- I think Chandler once f- feels better in a different deck sometimes. Like I, I uh, against Mason online, he's got it right now, but he's got it. He fills up that yard so fast. He's mm-hmm. got it like it's like a red, blue, green um, Tarmogoyf deck. And it's really good at filling up the yard. So this one here, I was worried about, but it seemed to work out pr- okay. Um, I do think it's early. Um, I don't have great revel. Did a ton of work. Interesting. Yeah, that's that's one that I I know Brandon is low on for Eidolon. Um, just thinking that it hurts you as much as it hurts everybody else. Yeah. Well, it did, it did do some of that. Um, yeah. I don't think I think he's better if he ends up in red blue or red white instead of kind of squeezing out the lands for three. Uh, I don't know if Boros Charm and Helix are really worth it. And um, the blue is literally only for Snapcaster Mage. Right. So I, I think that the, this is, this is I think, the only reason that's justifiable is I'm locked in a Dragon's Rage Channeler. I want to make sure I get that Delirium, so I need the fetch lands anyway. Right. So at that point, I'm only spending two picks instead of spending the six picks that he had to spend to get his mana fixed. Rabble Master should have been main deck. Wild. Okay. Uh, oh, there's a Frantic Search as well. I lied. Drago right. had, had, had two blue cards. But right. Yes. And then a pick I really like, they didn't main deck, but I think it's a really strong pick. I like the Imbreth Shieldbreaker. Um, I think that's a really interesting, uh, versatile pick in this type of deck. I like it even if it's not main deck, too. Ooh, yeah. Chems, I think that's a... <laughs> you got the blue, grab time walk for that. That's... Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I've been high on this versatility pick answer, and I just think mm-hmm. uh, a one-mana destroy artifact that becomes a 2-1 guy seems pretty decent uh, coming out of the board. One of my favorite cards from Standard, also obviously incredible in this deck. I didn't see how well it performed. I didn't get a chance to watch, but yeah, I didn't see. Shrine of Burning Rage is a card that you just drop and then just sit there and wait for the game to be over. It's it's a really fun card against the control decks if you can slide it through. Um, but no, I, I think that this is a really good red deck. I, I would have liked to see more focus on sideboard picks as opposed to there's a lot of cards that could be main deck that are not in the main deck in this list. Uh, things like Burning Tree Emissary, uh, like the... Uh, even things as simple as like skull crack and uh, like, I do not like the grim lava mancer. I will say fully like oh really see it, it, this is again I think the the fetch lands are justified by the dragon's rage channeler and the grim lava but mancer. there's not an they, those two work against each other first of all sure right so if I'm grim lava mancing out then I don't have delirium yep uh, and second of all like getting delirium is one thing but being able to fuel a lava mancer over enough turns to make it super relevant I mean how many activations do you need before it's good two Three, three. See, I, I think two is really fine, right? You're paying one. Ma- you're paying a one ma- one card to get five damage at that point, or get four damage. But I think something like a uh, robber of the rich, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or a, a, a hasty creature uh, there, uh, some kind of other hasty creature is probably, or even just a straight burn spell. Right. Yeah. Flame yeah. Flame Rift is the one. Not that art though. Come on, please get this nemesis <laughs> art in here. No, like Flame Rift, I think would be one that be I'd prefer to it probably. Um. Uh, yeah, and then uh, a card that he should have drafted in some of these lands and is Castle Embereth. Ooh, interesting. Castle Embereth. I've, we haven't seen many of the castles go, actually. I will tell you, right now, this card's great, yeah. um, I'm running uh, Vantress in the online one. Mm-hmm. Not, not Vantress, I'm running uh, the black one. Okay, yeah, Lock and Twain. It yep. is phenomenal. Yes. Like, because there's so many in the black discard deck, there's so many times where I'm just down to one or two cards or zero cards in my hand. I'm just yeah. playing my hand out, and it's just like, cool, end of turn, card one life, you know. No, uh, the Locked Wayne has been phenomenal, so. It's, yeah, just drawing the extra cards. And obviously, like, Castle Umbreth can beat down, especially in a creature based deck like this where you yeah. aren't going as many. Yeah, I like, think about that with Rabble Master. Yes. See, two gems, you mentioned that Boros Charm is one card for four damage. I agree. I don't think it's worth going into the second color for the when you have things like Flame Rift sitting on the table still afterwards. I think there's just enough good red cards that you could scrap some of the other colors and instead take things like Warmth to stop someone from stealing uh, Chill from you. You could actually take uh, some of the good red hate cards, like Boil would be one that would be pretty strong. Yeah. Also, the Indestructible doesn't help as much in this format because the two main sweepers, are your main sweepers are things like Toxic Deluge. Sure. And then we had uh, Settle. Settle wreckage, yeah. But uh, both, the, the, both of those, the Indestructible doesn't matter on, right? Um, and then working our way down, we have... Uh, we have Another, oh, we have a first timer in this. Uh, Nemo, I believe, has never played a VRD. No, never played a VRD, right? Yep. Uh, but Nemo decided to take the leap. We thought it was into a random editor deck to start, and then it was of sorts. It was of sorts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but made a little meander on over to find Dragon. All right. So I loved Nemo's list at first, mm-hmm. right? And then after watching Nemo lose a lunch, uh, talked to Nemo, 
And they, I loved it, and then they lost a bunch, right. and, and I well, didn't love it. And they pointed out that they felt, and then I realized that we should have probably caught this in analysis and draft, right? They, they said, I did not have enough um, things to fill my yard quick, sure. right? I had the Entomb, I had the Unmarked Grave, and I had Bizarre, but like they should have grabbed the looting, uh, or the new looting, for yeah. example. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you and I discussed today, I, I think, the real issue of th- this list probably. Because they have some amazing picks. Like Commune with the Gods, that pick's awesome. Agreed. Yep. Um, Once you decide to do the colors, then yes, I would. Right. Think. But I think that the, the issue that comes down to in this list is th- that World Gorger. I think World, World Gorger is one piece of it. I also think trying to go with that many colors means that you have to be taking cards like Forbidden Orchard, Reflecting Pool. Mm-hmm. You just have to... Like, there's other quibbles I have. I could be like, I don't think Sidisi is good enough. I think there's like other things I could argue about. But the big thing is just once again, mana. It's just the mana is in this deck is so hard in order to pull off things like creeping corrosion, rubbing a double green spell, right? Uh, alongside alongside your like uh, alongside your reanimator package, force of vigor kind of forces you hard that direction as well. There's just a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of getting dragged around um, that I don't think you necessarily need. And like you said, kind of you hinted at, there's too many big creatures here. Right. So the problem with World Gorger that ends up being, uh, that we discussed earlier, is that you have to have Animate Dead for it. Yes. Right? Does it work with Necromancy? It works with Necromancy. Okay. It also works with, uh, I don't know if it, Dance of the Dead is the other classic Right, I guess. One. So, but, so unless you have all of those, right? You, right. So you don't get Reanimate. You don't get some of it. And then you have to have another card on top of that to win with. Yep. Whether it's a Piranha Mire yep. to do the one damage when it comes in and out, or something to spend the, all the unlimited mana on, or a murderous red cap, or something, right? But you still have to have another card. So what appears like a two-card Monty becomes far more complex than a two-card Monty and probably just not worth it, right? It was soul-crushing to watch them do it on camera and actually manage to make it pull off. With the bitter ordeal win. Yes, uh, but not have the other card in the graveyard right. to target. And ultimately, that's the thing as well, that you it, it is not you have to have another card in your yard to target Yes, because otherwise the loop just keeps going on and on. And yeah, so that, that ended up being a draw that then the match went uh, and ended up being a loss in the end. Right. No, the bitter ordeal is a, is a cute way to win that game. Um, yeah. But no, I, I think Nemo, for the first time showing up and not having played the format before, did a really good job. Yeah. I, I think that this is a... There were lots of critiques we could make about it, but overall, like, for a first time playing the Reanimator deck, I think this is a, a good showing. All right, so take the shell. Yep. Drop out the red. Yep. And uh, pick up um, one of the black cards that goes with Thoracle. Sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like what what ha- and what happens and, and a, a couple more um, cards that let you fit, that fill his yard right yeah. frantic searchy type things mm-hmm. uh, I think this becomes a really good animator list reanimator list at that point yeah I was, I was with kinda, a backup to Oracle plan I was surprised to see Oracle without uh, the payoffs right like without the other pieces of it right. so a lot of people actually in chat at the time thought that Damnable Pack was a mistake that he meant tainted pack. Oh, interesting. But it wasn't. Damnable Pack was a infinite mana use for try to try to have infinite mana off a of World Gorger. Got it. Okay. But yeah, a lot of people in chat thought that Damnable was supposed to be tainted. Well, a tainted pack would explain all the lands too. Like it, it, yeah. it does kind of make everything come together. Right. If that is the pick. Um. Uh. So apparently, hyphen uh, talked to Nemo about this. Uh. Didn't take consultation. They didn't right. want to excel the card they wanted. So, yeah, this was just a lack of awareness of the two-card combo, yeah. it sounds yeah. like. Yeah, But that's okay. I mean, this is... It's, it's a really, it's yeah, a it's really a big time. format. And they were and they were an absolute blessing to have around. They, oh, were, yeah. they were amazing. They, they did a really good job coming in and helping out on commentary at the mm-hmm. end when I had to go. Like, they were an absolute hoot. So, uh, everything I want in someone coming and hanging out at the VRD. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kevin Freeman. Kevin Freeman managed to pull off three uh, mocks in the first three picks. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it was perfect because it matched up... Mox, mock, half mox. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, matched up perfectly with the uh, with the list, one of the two lists that yeah. he brought in, um, which I thought was going to be uh, just Cheerios, but turned out to actually be just a like, traditional aggro uh, affinity list. It was pretty cool to see. Yeah, wandering points out here, a, a big oversight on on Kevin's part, which is a lack of nettle cyst. Interesting. Uh, this was a, a constant chat discussion, mm-hmm. right? Like yeah, that's great. Yeah, uh, I mean, Kevin had the. Um, the white enchantment, right? Uh, that does a similar thing. Didn't 
Uh, the um, all the glitters. Yeah, yeah. Presumably that was in that list. Yep, all the glitters were taken yeah. in thirty eighth here. Yeah. So um, you know, Kevin does a couple of interesting things here. Uh, the Cauldra Battle Skull without the Stone Forge. Mm. Um, those look like hate picks. They were actually on his list. I think he was just assuming he was going to have enough mana to just to do them. Sure. Um, I think that's risky, right? I, yeah, I, that's th- th- things like that. I think are, are the overall. This list feels like it's it's like. 40 cards, or maybe maybe 35 cards towards a very strong affinity list. Right. And then there's just like a few things that just seem off and, and are, don't quite get there. Uh, not enough sideboard cards. Uh, it actually does pretty well in the middle of the sideboard. Uh, yeah. I was looking at here. In the middle, it actually does pretty well um, with, you know, Sphere, Cage, Cage, Sky, Needle. Things like Mirror Forcer probably aren't needed, but like right. I understand where you go there. Uh, the Ozolith was an interesting pick that we discussed a lot. A lot of people thought that was a really cool pick in this deck. I actually said it's not a good pick in this deck. Ooh. And the reason why was that it are so he gets blown out all the stuff goes to the Ozilus, but if they're playing if you're, he loses to artifact sweepers already exactly so his safety valve against those artifact sweepers is itself an artifact yeah and that doesn't do anything right so he the safety valve to make the blowout less good is also an artifact so it's going to get blown out as well the card that isn't an artifact however uh, second Sunrise. I love right. this pick in this list. I think it's really cool. I don't know if it's good. I think it's really cool, though. Yeah, I think Second Sunrise is fine. I don't think he needs second and Rally. Um, sure. You know, especially because Rally and, uh, it gets rid of them. His idea was with Rally that he can sack them all off at yeah, the end. Yeah, you, you Ravager up, right. then, sec- then Rally them back, and then sack right. them up yeah. again. Yeah. Um, so you, you, mean, you can basically play Atog at that point, right? right. It's, it's basically using Ravager as an Atog. Um, I think it's a cool idea, but yeah. I don't know if it's necessary. Yeah, I like some of these. I like I like Dispatch. So Kevin often presented a, a good enough early threat, but in this... So here's an interesting thing. I think this list is probably better in Lotus 5 or 6. Right? Yeah, that's fair. Where people are more a little more control-y and or a little more combo-oriented. You slide under them, yep. Right. Uh, today, where in this list, where people had... Uh, you know, there was more creature-based things, mm-hmm. right? That they simply outstriped you pretty quick. That makes sense. And on top of the general no, no thing that artifact decks are, decks are decently easy to hate out. Uh, not always. Uh, JHM's online showing us right now that you can just roll face still and you know with artifacts. Uh, but they are uh, you know a little easier to hate out at times as well. So Heliod Suncrown, is there a combo there I'm not seeing? Yeah, Walking Ballista. Okay, there we go. Okay. Yeah, it's the Ballista combo. That makes sense. Which so, has been drafted together a couple times. So sure. No. No, that seems good. Yeah. Um, I really the, I really like the last two picks that he made, the Thorming Stone and the Relentless Rats. I think yeah. that... I would have taken the Persistent Petitioners we already talked about that, but I think that basically trying to make that pick and making it the last second is a great choice. Yeah, he had that plan the whole time. He was just like, I'm going to last pick the rats. Yeah, so. no, it's, it's a great it's a great pick. It would have been great if he had told me about it so I could print them off ahead of it, but that's fine. It's fine. Right. It's <laughs> I like the Dispatch a lot. Yeah, Dispatch and, is fantastic. And I got to cheer for Michael Synth, Michael Synth Gollum. I mean, it's a horrible yeah. pick, but I got to cheer for it. I got to be like, Gollum, Gollum, Gollum. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cool... Power Depot was the card that I had not seen before that was I was very impressed with. Yeah. There was one point where I felt really bad for his mana base because he was going up against Eric. Yeah. Uh, no, he was up against Brandon. And... Brandon didn't have to drop the lattice because every card, I saw every that. land he had was an artifact land. He went and found it anyway. And I was yeah. like, why? Why? Well, he, he had a couple of lands after that, but he yeah. had a couple of lands. But like every land he hit was an artifact land, and he drops it. It's like, oh yeah, oops. <laughs> yeah, you just lose to uh, you lose to the to, yeah. It does nothing. So, um, Esper Sentinel is great. The Calder complete. I, I we already talked about. This. I think it's a little off, um, but the. Uh, overall, overall, I think this deck's great. Like, I really, I really I like, like the dispatch. idea of a like beat-down artifact affinity deck. This brings me back to when I first started playing Magic, uh, back in the perfect times of. Uh, so the problem I have with the dispatch is that it, it you know, it's always assuming he has perfect a board to pull it off. Sure. When uh, Path to Exile did not get drafted at all. No, okay. That's so fair. I think if you're in this deck, dispatch is amazing on the outs on the chance that you don't have, but you, he could have just got Path. So one card that I just noticed was not taken: Skull Clamp. Skull would have been great in this deck. Yeah, Clamp should have been taken for sure. That did not get taken. Oh, oh. Yeah. Like, Ginger Brood I'm confused by, but I, I, I believe you can modular around to it. I can see the path. I just don't... It's a little... It's a, he's made, he, he can become unblockable is the idea. So yeah. I think he, he was. that's based around that there was a standard deck and even a historic deck that you're all you're dropping all the glitters on Ginger Brutes sure. and then you make it unblockable and it gets through. So it's a... Yeah, I mean, that told, I, 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 I told him I was threatening to slap him for that because that <laughs> could have been at the very end, right? Like... Uh, 
but overall, I think his list is better than his record shows here. Yeah, I, his it does it does seem like a pretty well drafted deck. Overall. Even if it's not better than his record, I think it's a very good it's a very good shot at this list, yeah. and it kind of shows again a, another area that's probably vastly underexplored. Agreed. Um, if I'm going to go something like this, I'm going to go black, and I'm going to go disciple of the vault. Sure. And give my way to sack and blow people out with Disciple. You're going to take all the little orbs, too? Pay a bunch of one mana? I mean... Pop off some spell bombs? Not, I, I think you go to something just like this when you're just going to have but have the Disciple as a... You know, because there's going to be a point where they're going to stop you. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And Disciple gives you that, okay, well, cool, I've got you down to eight. Yep. And now, okay, cool, arc bounce, sack, go. Or they're going to go meltdown, and you're gonna, then they're going to lose, you know? See, I, I like the white deck uh I, I the card there's a few cards that i would like to throw in there here but i think uh refurbish is one that uh that jumps immediately to, or not refurbish what is the oh is it open the vaults is that the one that oh, is six mana what's the four mana version there's a four mana version that does it just to artifacts re, re, just to artifacts maybe i'm wrong maybe uh, it's for only enchantments yeah it's replenished for enchantments ah uh, okay all right well i got nothing then okay in that case i think it's, it's perfect he right. did a great job so, uh, <laughs> Yeah, no. Uh, overall, those this this draft felt incredibly tight. I think this was this and six. It feels like we're really kind of getting to a spot where there are no major horrible mistakes. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, uh, as I said. So my card uh, that I had not seen. I'm sure it's been drafted. Uh, I know it was drafted in one mm-hmm. and maybe in two, but I had not seen at least since two or three. Um, that I think was the most impressive to me was K- Kataki uh, Kataki Wars Wage. Yeah, Kataki apparently um, roughly half the drafts, and yeah. it's been yeah around twenty five. Yeah, so Kataki was just phenomenal when he dropped it all day long. So that was one that I was very very happy to see. It was my my pick of the day. Mm. Face rewards, yeah, the kind of the worst version of Second Sunrise uh, right. also could have been easily slotted into this deck. So, but yeah, Kataki's great. Um, Cool. So that, I think that covers this draft. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're not going to break down the two online drafts that have happened since this point, no. but they're pretty exciting. If you want to go check them out, the Discord is a great place to go. From stlotus.org, of course, linked as everything else is. Uh, and you can go participate in your own draft. I'm sure there'll be another one starting up very soon. Yeah. So we're both we're, they both hit a little lull spot, but I think they'll be they'll be finishing up and definitely uh, check out the Discord if that's you know it is. Some, we've had some really good discussion there. Um, yes. You know, some lively back and forths over. You know the value of cards, mid-range combo, things like that. So, mm-hmm. so the the other next section we're going to go into after this draft is let's talk about some of the rules that we have going on in the format right now. Um, we can talk through like changes that we made this time, as well as some changes that we are looking at, thinking about what's kind of on the what, what does Watsi call it now? There's like a watch list and an right. act ban list. Uh, so we have uh, we we've been trying some new things. Uh, yeah, Brandon, we actually started talking talking up your deck. So. Uh, we you, you can go back and watch the VOD, but it was great. We, yeah. we talked through the whole thing. Um, the the rules changes. So the big ones we made this time... Uh, self-referential cards. Self-referential cards, we said... Uh, or no, the any number of cards. Was, self-referential is a different conversation. So Relentless Rats is one right. that we brought off of the list. Same thing as Wastes. They both came in. Yeah. Um, we said for uh, for Relentless Rats and Snow-Covered Lands, you pick one and you get any number of you want. Right. Uh, that's one that we're pretty happy with. We're going to end up solidifying it and taking it off the we're going to try it and move it to we're happy with this we're going to keep it but we're probably going to make a tweak right the tweak is going to be that it's going to be bumping it down to 25 you can play at most 25 of a card uh when it says any number the idea there being that we want to make sure that there is still some possibility of a mill deck. Uh, of a mill deck existing so what we don't want to see is i'm gonna just there's a mill i see a mill deck so i'm just going to take Rent little sats at the end, or one a number of these cards, right. and then be able to side up to a 500 card deck, which will you know give them absolutely no shot um, to get through that, right? And like with 25, you still can go up to something like uh, like 100, 120, somewhere in that range. Uh, yeah. so, so it's not going to be an easy time for mill, but it won't be a complete just one card answer to a deck, right? Uh, so so that's... one card viable answer to a deck because oh, you right. can still go that uh, you go to five hundred still, but it's just basic lands at that point. Yes, but like one card and actually still have a chance to win, like, you know, yes. aggressively answer to the deck. Right. So that's one that we're we're happy with. We're taking off the watch list and just kind of tweaking it to lock it in. Yeah. Um, Self referential cards. Uh, we we talked about these uh, being things like uh, rune snag is one that we were like let's maybe we should think about whether AK. this comes off uh, ancestral uh, ancestral knowledge accumulated accumulated knowledge sorry. Uh, but yeah, all these cards that kind of are like, 
referencing themselves was something where like that'd be a cool idea if you get four of these and you take one uh cards like rune snag just really uh, are very concerning and i think that we're not even going to try it it's right. just it would just be oh and then someone came shady. up on the discord of one more that we'd forgot about which one was that uh the ritual oh yeah right of flame yeah i, I think right of flame i mean it would still be good uh, i think it still is a good card by itself but yeah, yeah th th this whole cycle i think is uh is potentially problematic and yeah. not it doesn't have enough payoff to justify the risk of adding it in so we're just not going to proceed forward going with that one road. um tie breaks is another one yeah tie breaks so last time we we've always done we don't we don't, don't care about your record inside of a match it's just if you are tied for match points we're going to do playoffs and we will play off the games and we're going to stay there all night and make sure we figure out who's in first second third and fourth these things are very long yeah <laughs> uh when you show up at six in the morning and then end up finishing around eleven thirty at night that gets tiring so uh this time we actually kind of impromptu fell into this tweak that we really liked which is that we're always going to play off to see who takes first. So still by matches, we're going to play that, see who gets the first place. However, if there are three or fewer people tied for four, for uh, uh, third or fourth position, they're going to be decided on breaks. And uh, essentially, any any things that goes beyond the, the first four picks that would normally get picks, it just shifts the down. And the first prize, whoever takes first, has to give up one of their bottles. So it, it's essentially a way of making sure that people in... Uh, if you're sixth position, you don't have to like sit around with uh, a mini tournament, uh, mini round robin tournament, in order to try to win one bottle fifth pick right. and stay keep up until midnight. It's not very much fun. So, and then the next one is one that's just in discussion. We have no, we we've not had the discussion yet. We've had the starts of it. Yeah, uh, we, we nothing concrete yet. Uh, but there was long ago in the days of yore, <laughs> when old men like me walked the earth, um, there was a deck called the Four Horsemen. Yes. Um, and so this was a legacy deck that involved things like Mesmeric Orb and Milling Yourself. And eventually you would get to a board state where um, it was... I, I believe... So if I remember the comic... involved Emrakul. <laughs> yes. So, so you, had, you needed to have an Emrakul in your deck or one of the Titans in right. your deck. And then you had to have at least three copies of Narcomoeba above it. Uh, in your decks so that you could mill three copies of Narcomoeba into your graveyard and then use them to cast Dread Return on something else. Uh, and and you could just keep shuffling until you always until you would eventually mathematically guaranteed end up with three Narcomoebas that are in play, a Dread Return in your graveyard, and the creature you want to reanimate in your graveyard. Right. And the Emrakul being the last card in your deck. So you never milled yourself. So you never milled yourself. And, and the idea was that you would reanimate this card. I don't remember exactly what it was. Uh, but it would, uh, it, it, when it came into play, it would, uh, it would win you the game, and you didn't necessarily, you didn't care about the Emrakul sitting there. However, there's no way to say this is going to be in five iterations or this is going to be in a hundred thousand iterations. But you know, guaranteed, it will come up if you keep doing this loop over and over again. So they changed the rules. Yes. Long story short, they made it to where if a loop is indeterminate, where you cannot know how many iterations it will take. Um, then uh, you will... Point of clarification. The last the last thing was... Shroom. Uh, Shroom with Blasting Station. Right. To be able to deal one point of damage and then redo that loop. So um, it, it counted as slow play, however. Right. That if you do not have a set amount of iterations, if you can't tell me how many you're going to do, that it's slow play. And if you do it, you will eventually get a game loss because you keep trying to slow play. Yes. Um, we're discussing whether we want to keep that in. Now, in honesty, it probably doesn't matter because you don't have three copies of Narcomoeba. It doesn't matter for this deck. I think right. there probably is, there are other non-deterministic combos that you could guaranteed say the board state will end up in a position where I win, and right. it's mathematically provable that it gets there. Right. Uh, so I think it would be uh, Mason brought this up as Mason is, a, is is thinking about these things all the time, so I'm sure he already had an idea in mind. Uh, but he asked the question of whether these things are soft banned here as well, uh, and the answer for this tournament was yes. Uh, the actual answer for next tournament is we're still thinking about it and trying to no, a bunch see of what's going to happen. Possibly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so the, the Gitrog uh, CEDH deck is one that has a lot of these loops. Um, and that deck usually can find ways to win without those loops in case you are playing in an actual tournament. But there's a lot of like fun uh, deck more salvage loops that happen with, uh, with, with uh, Gitrog. So right. I think at some point we'll probably allow for it to happen but we need to figure out the right wording and we need to make sure that there's not something obvious that we're missing so right. uh feedback welcome but overall we're thinking about essentially undoing the soft ban on four horsemen right the slow play penalty on it yep so 
All right, so, so that's our rule changes. Yeah, the, everything else we're very happy with. Everything's been holding pretty steady. I think the, the four of for self-tutoring cards has been very good. Yeah. Overall, things are great. Um, next thing we talk about is the surprise VRD. Right. So we mentioned this a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. um, there is so a group uh, led by uh, Redbeard, a uh, judge, uh, L2 judge, mm -hmm. um, is putting together a VRD for some event. I'm not sure what. Uh, no, it's just a, it's a just, VRD. I oh, yeah. just want to do a VRD. So uh, they, they are putting together a VRD, and they asked about streaming it under the St. Lotus brand. Mm -hmm. um, so we uh, we talked to them, and we worked it out, and we uh, decided we were going to uh, allow it to an extent. We're going to see how it goes, right? And uh, we're going to have one of our announcers there. It looks like it'll be Eric Levine. Um, so it will truly still be a, a St. Lotus affiliated. It's mm -hmm. not just someone else using our, our login. St. Lotus Presents. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And then I think you're playing that, aren't you? I, I am. That's okay. the plan right now. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. These things are always... I've never had one of these VRDs go off without somebody bailing the week right. of. <laughs> so we'll see what actually happens. But yes, I, I will be there in some way, hopefully playing on the event. Yeah. Be late so week. that one will be November 20th. Yes, I'm super excited. Uh, but we are only going to be streaming the draft portion. Right. So uh, again, long all-day affairs. Uh, the the other portions have bigger logistics. It's harder on the announcers, etc. Mm -hmm. So for this one, we're only going to be stringing the draft portion rather than the games portion. And then, of course, uh, official v St. Lotus VRD number eight. Uh, as we said earlier, it will be coming up in January, mm -hmm. and our date will be January eighth. Yeah. So looking forward to seeing people on November twentieth for the actual for the next uh, St. Lotus presents going to be. Uh, it's going to be out in St. Charles, uh, Brandon. It's going to be right around here in St. Louis. Uh, and the uh, the players are already locked in for that when everything's already set. They basically are handling their own thing. We're just showing up to help out with commentary and some of the uh, logistics around the event. Um, but yeah, the VRD8 is going to be uh, to see if Brandon can defend his honor, see if he can uh, take home a second one. Um, my hope is that Sam comes and it just crushes him and actually yeah. manages to, uh, to to win the to, to win on camera and force him to sign the the giant killer. Uh, that would be amazing to watch him lose to his girlfriend on camera. Right, that's gonna be awesome. Uh, but yeah, we're still locking in all the players for that one. But we have we have a good portion of them set up for yeah. it, and it should be uh, it should be a good time. So, all right. Well, thank you for tuning in to the recap show, and uh, we're looking forward again. Uh, again, you can find us on Twitter uh, at uh, under St. Lotus. Yep. And you can find us on us and everyone else in the uh, ever growing uh, VRD community on the Discord. So. Uh, stlotus.org has links to all the things yeah so and you go to stlotus.org we have links to every single one of those things and uh we're also rolling out uh always discussing and rolling out improvements for the st lotus website as well mm -hmm. so keep an eye out for those that's right looking forward to doing some draft analysis deck analysis and uh potentially some format stuff too so absolutely cool uh looking forward to seeing everybody and thanks for tuning in all right thanks a lot